Oh, thank you. <laughs> Eventually, uh, not independent. They are just completely conjugated. Good. That describes uh, the central <laughs> part of our structure. And what will happen at uh, Superconductors, well, at superconductors we have and wave scattering. So each uh, electronic wave which comes to superconductor uh, will be reverted into whole wave and vice versa. <laughs> Upon this reversion, it acquires a phase factor. Let us see whether I have phase factor. Phase factor. Okay, here I found it. So this phase factor contains from energy dependent uh, contains energy dependent term, and uh, also a term uh, which uh, gives you the phase of superconductor. That's where phase difference is incorporated. Good, so we have a scattering problem, but this scattering problem is different from what we have considered previously, because there is no wave which comes to the structure. All waves we just consider are localized on this junction. There is no way uh, from the junction, at least the e at energies which is smaller than the gap energy, all right? For normal matter, we could just set, you know, uh, incoming wave with amplitude one and compute all other scattering amplitudes. No way to do it here. So what do we have to do? Just recognize that in this case we have a bound state. So there is no <laughs> propagating waves at any energy but there could be a special energy at which the wave could exist. So how do we do this? We look at the amplitudes of all um, outgoing waves, outgoing from the central part, from the junction. From one hand, it is given by incoming waves and the scattering matrix of the middle region. But from the other hand, these incoming waves come about under wave reflection. So we have a closed equation for psi out, right? Which has a solution only if the product of these two matrices has a very certain eigenvalue. Which eigenvalue? One, right? So in this case, both parts of this equation match if this eigenvalue is one. Very good. So we have an equation to solve. The scattering matrix of Andreev part does depend on superconducting phase and energy. So as a result, we find the energy of the bound state as a function of phase. Good, here it is, here's the expression. As we see, again, this is uh, uh, the beauty of scattering approach. You can express your answer in terms of transmission coefficients. So this is for one channel, of course. If you have more channels, you have a sum. You have many levels, many energies with individual transmission coefficients. All right. So 
So I plot these energies versus phase for our different um, transmission coefficients. Let us see. Let us look at this curve, which is very close to the edge. And let us look at this curve, which hit zero. Red and uh, green, which curve corresponds to small transmission coefficient? Yeah? The upper one, right. So if transmission coefficient is small, we kind of can expand the square root. We have energy which is most one is very close to the gap edge, to the spectrum, uh, to the spectrum of uh, continuous states. And uh, right, opposite limit, T equals one. And then at certain value of uh, phase, we hit zero. Okay, then a control question for the lecture of yesterday. What is this? What kind of state we have now? Okay, which is similar to what has been discussed yesterday, how we call it? Majorana, right. So Majoranas are supposed to be states which lie at zero energy. No, it's not quite Majorana, right? So uh, let me explain the difference. Uh, Majorana is pinned to zero energy. If you change parameters of the system, it stays there, all right? Here you just uh, change the phase a bit, it departs from zero energy. But anyway, it uh, gives you at least uh, uh, hope that you can realize zero energy states, which are useful for quantum computation, uh, whatever. Uh, right, so uh, in order to uh, do this, this approach shows that you cannot just take any black box. Eh? You really need to design the structure, and it has been explained yesterday how you have to design it in order to um, achieve, achieve uh, stable Majorana state, which is pinned to zero energy in finite interval of parameters, at least with exponential accuracy. Yes? Okay. So in the statement you have to try out on that, so the first thing is the one that just describes the first of the energy part, and then the second one is the one that gets the structure from the system. Right. What about the others that just All the, uh, if one just takes a, a, a story of individual particle, of course it experiences a lot of unfair reflection, coming back and so on. <coughs> but, well, uh, that is all incorporated in this, this equation. Okay. More questions? So the summary is that in any structure, in any blackboards between two superconductors, one can realize these bound states with energies dependent on the phase. Since it depends on the phase, then uh, we can have superconducting currents. Right, so for many channels, we have these energies. Okay, at the moment there are positive excitation energies. And uh, basically I would like to uh, understand the ground state and I don't want to have any excitations in the structure. Just let's uh, keep temperature low so the structure is the ground state. Uh, and that's not precisely the same as excitation energy. However, it turns out that ground state energy can be expressed through these 
excitation energy. Which uh, kind of uh, can be explained very fast, but okay, then let's see. Uh, there is an uh, interesting error in this reasoning. Okay, so this is structure and there are states. So le let it be energy axis. And as we have learned from superconductivity uh, also yesterday, the uh, spectrum is uh, mirror one for each state with positive energy, we have its counterpart, the state with negative energy. Good. Then this state is below Fermi level. It is filled, and it gives us this formula, right? So the energies of the field states. It's very s kind of popular explanation, and uh, uh, frankly, I've heard this literally in many talks. It's wrong. Let us uh, pay attention to this formula. What is missed here? The formula is correct. But what would be ex what would be the result of this formula? Mm. Let me put lit little errors on these levels. Yeah, indeed. If you kind of uh, reason at this level, you expect factor of Two coming from spin. No such luck. In fact, very f formula is very strange, but one can, you know, I to, to prove it even for normal electrons. As a matter of fact, if you do, if you count the energy of the ground state in this wave, you have to divide I the energy of each, each level o by the factor of two which is subsequently cancelled by a factor of two coming from spin. Okay, energy is this, so we know the energy as a function of phase. Right, so we can differentiate it with respect to uh, phase. That's the result. Simple analytical formula for the current. Here, plot it. Again, the smallest current is for very little transmission. One can see that from this formula. Small t's, no transmission, no current. That's, that's obvious, right? And uh, the current grows, and it becomes less, less sinusoidal in this case. So finally, it becomes a function with a, with a, with a jump. Huh? There is a jump at 2 pi if transmission coefficient is 1. All right, that's what I wanted to say about Andreev bound states, which uh, give uh, very interesting possibilities for engineering quantum states at rather large scales in, in superconducting nanostructures. Any questions? Yes? Uh, can you repeat once again, uh, in this region we have rival double counting? We were double counting and then uh, because of the spin it generates some of the stuff that can get Yes, 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 yes. yes. So if we stick to this approach, suppose we, we don't have uh, 
any superconducting field, we, we just have normal metal. Even in normal metal, we have a, a level for electrons and a level for coals, right? So we count it twice from the beginning. That's why we need the spectra of one half. It's double counting already. Uh, fine. All right. I just want to mention traditional Johnson expression, which is the limit at small tunnel contact. So it's just take this formula. You go to the limit of small transmission coefficient. There is a, the current becomes very convenient function, just sinusoidal, and that's it. That's what Josephson actually assumed because uh, in uh, his time they could make only tunnel contacts between two superconductors. All right, so if there are no questions, I will switch to the next topic. Uh, let us see. What I would like to discuss, and that could have been long lecture, I will have to talk, talk compact it a bit, uh, is the relation between quantum mechanics and Ohm's law. And that's supposed to be rather pedagogical lecture. So I will come back to the double junction setup we have considered in the second lecture about interference, you remember A on the roof, B on the roof, and there's something in between which appeared to be important. Illustration of quantum interference. And uh, I will f formulate this a paradox, and okay, as any bad tricker, I will show that there is no trick. Uh, here, there's a simple solution to the paradox, but that will eventually lead us to understanding how Ohm's law arises in a scattering approach. It does so upon increasing the number of the channels. If you take a scatter, uh, a scatter of these many channels, we will see how Ohm's law will be restored. Right, and it gives me an opportunity to talk a bit about more standard uh, description of uh, electron transport in solids. How to relate it to scattering approach, to the reality, and in particular to the reality about electricity to uh, finite element theory by Gustav Kirchhoff which is completely based on conservation loss. If you recall what they told you about Kirchhoff rules, this is just manifestation of charge conservation in any node of, uh, uh, of the electric circuit. Good. That would be pedagogical part. Anti-pedagogical part would be information about the fact that eventually quantum mechanics allows more conservation laws than classical physics. And using these conservation laws, one can build up circuit theories, which cannot you know, give you scattering matrix, cannot give you individual stories of uh, quantum waves, but still, they are able to describe physics of coherent scattering with, uh, in the situation with a big uh, number of channels. And in distinction from Ohm's law, they don't disregard quantum mechanics. There is still some quantum mechanics inside. So this bunch of theories are called quantum circuit theory. All right, that's planned for the rest of our time.
let me basically repeat what I'm going to do, right? So it's about making bridges. We have studied uh, scattering transport, uh, quantum transport, electron waves, scattering matrix. Uh, that's uh, in apparent contradiction to something which you knew from uh, uh, school benches. Huh? There are electric currents, Ohm's law, circuit uh, elements, resistors, whatever capacitors. Huh? So uh, a simple bridge would be to show equivalence between uh, quantum scattering and Ohm's law. A uh, more sophisticated bridge is to describe quantum mechanical phenomena in a language related to Ohm's law. Fine, so let me start with a double junction. So we put two junctions in series, two scattering barriers, and it would be convenient for me to keep transmission coefficients very low. And let me just uh, estimate, we, do, we did make kind of exact calculation, but uh, yeah, uh, exact calculations in physics, they're all senseless, you know. <laughs> Let me make uh, just estimation. How could I estimate uh, conductance of the structure? Uh, it is related to the amplitude of the transfer, and apparently this amplitude is the product of two amplitudes, right? From the other hand, the conductances of the barriers are just squares of these amplitudes, this coefficient uh, which is conductance quantum, right? So I immediately get very interesting and simple law. The conductance of the whole structure is a product of conductances of the constituents, right? That's what I write. That's what comes from quantum estimation. I put here GQ just to keep dimension proper. Good. That's one side of the paradox. Another side of paradox, uh, 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 again, it comes from, to, uh, from school benches. I can regard each scatter as a resistor. And here I have two resistors in series. The total resistance is the sum of the two. If I rewrite it in conductances, what do I have? Oh. Here it is. And we see that our approach has been partially successful. We could reproduce the upper half of the fraction. But there's something wrong in, 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 in the denominator. Also, it scales differently. If I change conductances by a factor of two, uh, each conductance I have a change of uh, four here, while here it's still the change of a factor of two. Right, so this is a paradox, and uh, eventually we didn't have to think much about the solution because we have more explicit formulas for transmissions from the barrier, right? <coughs> you would remember, how do we compute it? We have considered all possible electron transfers with different number of bounces, and we got the expression for transmission coefficient which depends on the phase, which is accumulated during the bounds between two scatterers. Fine. Let us now integrate over the phase. And by the way, that corresponds to summing not the amplitudes, but summing par particular probabilities of this process. That's what we get. 
that doesn't depend on phase naturally it's the result of hemorrhaging right and if you take uh, if you assume small transmission coefficients we could disregard this last term here huh we almost there so the average transmission this case roughly uh, uh, has uh, is roughly the same as given by <coughs> Ohm's law okay how does it happen in detail here this Fabry Pierrot picture of the transmission between uh, through, through two scatterers and the transmission peaks up to values of the road of one but in very narrow region of the phases and uh, most at most values of the phase it is low and this corresponds to naive estimation we have started with it's proportional to the square of transmission coefficient right but when averaging we have to take to into account the existence of the peaks the exist existence of resonances and okay that's why the average is proportional to t peaks at one minimum t squared average at t good that's rough explanation of ohm's law strangely enough ohm's law arises from <coughs> resonant states the states which are localized between two barriers and provide enhanced transmission good Averaging, let us see. The idea is that Ohm's law will be um, uh, fulfilled automatically if I depart from one channel situation, if I go to situation with many channels. Right, here I draw a naive picture. So the same colored lines are Fabry Perot patterns for each channel, but channels are different, the periods of these patterns are different. So the result is given by sigma Klein, and it fluctuates away less than, uh, than um, the transmissions of individual channels. Right? If we take more, we would have more more um, but we would have better averaging right it would be something like this okay we can assume so so we can assume independent ch uh, channels and uh, uh, all right if you average over the phases of these channels we get to here Yeah, it looks very much like Ohm's law, but not quite. Eh? Here it's Ohm's law. So how does it come about? What is the proper uh, way to think about this? A uh, proper way is to say there are no independent channels in this, uh, in this setup. Rather, that and between A and B, becomes rather involved it's not a single phase factor it's a unitary matrix scattering matrix which mixes up all incoming channels and outgoing channels okay so if we accept this we will reproduce Ohm's law exactly so combining two nanostructures always involves some end 
some element which joins this nanostructure. And this is eventually a unitary mi mixer, a random unitary matrix. Perhaps it was to remind some mass, each unitary matrix can be diagonalized. And what you find at diagonals are phase vectors, are uh, complex numbers of uh, unity modulus. Good. I'm done with paradox. Any questions about this? So I f when I first uh, hear about this explanation, I couldn't believe that that looked too fancy <laughs> to me. Uh, Ohm's law is such a simple elementary thing. Why would I have to uh, think about a scatter in, in uh, uh, so complex manner? Yeah, but that's reality. That's how it arises. Yes? There's no issue with the non complication anyway, right? No. Here I really stick to waves which have certain energy. I could derive Ohm's law for each energy separately. Since I'm not, I, I, I don't want to consider inelastic processes, I just uh, keep coherent wave propagation. More questions, comments? Yeah? Yeah, that will be a process as a result of uh, scattering very small scattering in the region which physically connects the, the contacts. <laughs> Convenient way is to uh, again use uh, um, 2D electron gas and shape it like this. So there are constrictions here and here. And if you look at uh, electron classically, what would it do? It will go from this junction, will refer to um, will bounce on the walls. So it will make quite a history before going to this junction. All right. Interest, interestingly, this region has no resistance, at least in comparison with these constrictions. All resistance is here. So what this region does, just randomizes the phases of incoming and outgoing waves, just provides a realization of scattering matrix with very many different phase vectors. Yes? Uh, well, here we can put it in one transmission, but I guess we could do the same thing with the section for the wall to the transmission. Uh, and is this also consistent with Ohm's law? Because for Ohm's law, you don't have anything reflected back because it means it doesn't have some. I would know how to uh, compute reflections through Ohm's law. But anyway, it's, uh, it's all about transport, huh? Okay. Reflection is not transport. So let, let, let's forget about it. <laughs> this unitary matrix, again, it has nothing to do with dissipation. There is no dissipation in the setup I consider. I just consider a wave which has certain energy frequencies. I could have done it for light, and there is no uh, dissipation. <coughs> so it is uh, restoration of quantum uh, classical mechanics, not by means of some inelastic processes, not by means of some decoherent processes, how it happens in qubit physics. It is restoration uh, just by averaging. Yes? Uh, 
idea it's a member of a certain ensemble from the matrices so each uh, concrete nano structure represents a member of ensemble of uh, random matrices and uh, okay uh, this differs from structure to structure upon the average and you uh, reproduce also uh, fine more questions more comments let me go false right this is just piece of uh, philosophy we could skip it but anyway let's uh, since on the uh, transparency let me go through so we have unitary matrix we need it to, to come back to scatter us with big number of channels and it has wave sheets if the size of the structure is bigger than wavelengths of the electron these phase shifts are big and also okay any imperfectness of the structure would lead to extra scattering to extra phase shifts right so it would be fair to say that present technology we could not control phase shifts for big number of channels perhaps one could do it for one channel perhaps uh, with some machine learning you could do it for two but well uh, it would be impossible to make it uh, like for 30 because we have a metric 30 by 30 uh, yeah it's uh, awful uh, yeah but perhaps you need to solve this big matrix in order to build quantum computers so there's a catch-22 um, yeah what I would like to say well uh, there's no chance to control it and we s just stamp you know formally identical nanostructures but the pictures of uh, phase shifts will be entirely different they will be different so the more channels we have the less control we have and uh, generally, this randomness is a, is a, is a just a signature of our ignorance. Eh? We just cannot, cannot know that much numbers. But, well, perhaps uh, ignorance is not bad at all times. Sometimes it's just a blessing. And perhaps you don't have to know all these phase shifts. All right? The analogy which uh, comes to my mind very quickly is about the relation between classical mechanics and statistical physics. In principle, to describe air in this room, one has to know coordinates of each molecule, velocities of each molecule. But it would be rather excessive description, would you agree? We just need temperature, pressure, a couple of numbers. Uh, right? So averaging similar to what we have in statistical mechanics eventually leads to, to uh, quantum structures, uh, to, uh, sorry, to uh, classical transport, uh, right? We could achieve it in two ways. We could just average over formally identical nanostructures, uh, or we could rely on self-averaging so for many channels, the self-averaging would occur just within each sample. And we got to uh, the loss of classical uh, electricity propagation. We got to Ohm's law. But let me again remind you, I have said it uh, several times, it's not yet classical electrons, you know, these little balls, particles, which they are still coherent waves. So we have classical, uh, classical laws at the level of coherent waves. So there are some quantum mechanics left in this setup. And we will recover it with quantum circuit theory. Good. That was philosophical part. Time to wake up. Let's go back to the 20s of uh, 20th century. That time, people were smart. And uh, upon um, 
in early days of quantum mechanics, they have been confronted with a terrible problem. It's impossible to describe quantum mechanical transport in solids. What is the problem? So here I put some crystal lattice, and if there are no impurities in this crystal lattice, everything is fine. There are very nice wave functions, block waves, which I draw it as, you know, regular wave fronts. That was fine. And that would be pretty good for thermodynamics of, uh, of solids. But if you would like to describe resistance, then you have to care about scattering at the impurities. And that terribly complicates the problem. I just set three impurities. And you see what kind of complex wave pattern I have. Each impurity is a source of extra waves, circular shape. So with the three impurities, uh, the wave pattern becomes uh, hopelessly complex. And we have zillions of impurities in the sample. So there is no way to build up quantum mechanical description of the transport. So all stories should have stopped in 20s or 20th century. <laughs> well, fortunately, people were smart at the time. And they said, well, eh, forget about the waves. Let's consider an electron as a ball. It just flies into space. It comes to impurity. It, it uh, experiences random scattering. It gets further away. And that would be a proper description, right? Let me go through some mathematical details and steps of this description, right? So how we can go from quantum chem mechanical description of a transport to common sense about electricity. Right. First of all, I'd like to talk about feeling factors, about number of field states in a small cube of momentum space and a uh, given point of my sample, a feeling factor which depends on uh, x and momentum. All right, I wrote a quantum mechanical expression for that in terms of all uh, uh, wave functions of the system, all, all, field, uh, all wave functions of field states. Okay, that's terribly complex. Fortunately, in order to write equation which determines this feeling factor, we don't have to know quantum mechanics. We could just rely on conservation of particles in a small cube of this six-dimensional space. We have to take into account that the cube itself moves, right? So this is conservation of particles. Here, I took into account that the cube moves. All right, so there is a uh, time derivative of its coordinate, time derivative of momentum, and this is velocity and force correspondingly. Right, so we have an equation for electron transport. Um, without impurities yet. Good, Patriots, French name associated with the equation. We will, yes, good. <coughs> so how to uh, augment this equation with impurities? Very simple, we just assume that the scattering and impurities is stochastic. So uh, we introduce the terms in this particle balance. There are some particles we, uh, at, um, with momentum P prime, and they scatter from the state P prime to the state P we are at. This has, has actually index. Uh, right. 
that's direct process. Also, the particles from this state are scattered to all other states. All right, so it's an example of master equation over to our German patriots. Boltzmann. Boltzmann equation. All right. Good, we solve the problem and, and we describe it at very um, rather macroscopic scale. It's bigger than the wavelengths, otherwise we would ha have to go to quantum mechanics. Uh, but still the scale is very small. It is smaller than the typical mean free pass. typical time of scattering. If we go to larger time scales, we can regard feeling factor to be an isotropic quantity. It wouldn't depend on momenta. Why is it so very simple? The electrons have been scattered many, many times at the scale, so the distribution has to be isotropic. Well, almost, because there has to be current, so there will be term in this distribution proportional to the velocity. Good, that's how we can come to diffusion equation. It's a rather unusual diffusion equation. It's still at certain energy, right? So this divergence, uh, change of field factor in a given point is a divergence of a current and the current density, current density, in more direct terms, has a term which comes with diffusion coefficient. And that is gradient of the filling factor, standard diffusion term. And it, ha uh, it has also a term coming from force. So it's drag diffusion equation, how they call it in theory of uh, what? semiconductors, I believe. Right, this equation holds an each energy. We don't care about uh, so fine characteristics uh, transport at each energy. We just integrate it over all energies. We consider all electrons involved. Fine. So we have the total change of charge density. We have integrated field factor over, over energies, momentum, which is divergence of electric current. Okay, we integrate this term. We got that the current <laughs> is proportional to electric field, local electric field, with some coefficient, which is called Say it in your native language if you don't remember in English. <laughs> this coefficient sigma is called? Very good. Right. And there is also a term which uh, would uh, be proportional to gradients of uh, charge density, but let's assume good metal, there was no charge density in good metal at zero. So we just have current proportional to local electric field. Okay, we've done at fundamental level, but I would like to go further. Sure. That's we, what, where we are. If there is a uniform sample, you know, with uniform uh, electric field, there's nothing to do. We have a relation between constant current density and constant field. But, well, practical conductors are not quite uniform. Suppose I would like to understand conductance in such a piece of metal. Good. What professors say? In this case, you need to solve second-order differential equation. So how come? 
simple to derive. Divergence of the current must be zero, and this gives you an equation on potential distribution. The potential distribution is fixed at the end, but there is some potential distribution inside the structure. Hmm. Trivial problem. You just put everything into computer, push the button, you get potential distribution. Catch 22 is as follows. In order to make a computer, you first have to design simple resistances like this. So that's again impossible. And there was, in my uh, view, a, a really great guy. And I guess without him, electromagnetism would be an abstract theory taught at universities like we hear now stories about Maya runners like, it, like this, right? So if there is no this guy, um, We would have a lecture about magnetism, perhaps even about quantum transport, but there would have been candles in this projector. <laughs> right? So who knows the first name of the guy? Second name, uh, uh, second name is on the transparency. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it's not Max. <laughs> uh, that's first perhaps a problem with this guy. Uh, his name was Gustav Kirov. Right. And um, he really made the soul level by getting out of, you know, professor-like differential equations by reducing these differential equations to finite element equations. And since that uh, year, since that we, we can treat electric circuits, at least at this level. So what was his theory? One does have to uh, think of each point of the sample. Let's make it uh, simple. Let's make zero approximation and zero approximation. It consists of three resistors corresponding to the branches. These resistors come together in a single node. Right, so voltages over here are known. We don't know the voltage in the node. How do we solve the voltage in the node? It's a Kirchhoff rule. The sum of the currents in each node is zero, precisely, charge conservation. From the other hand, the currents are functions of the voltage. So we have a linear equation. With this linear equation, we solve for the voltage in the node, and then finally we find currents in each branch of the circuit. Gustav Kirchhoff. Um, was a theory of great practical relevance, uh, and one has to pay for advantages. It took him 30 years to uh, get a permanent job at German University. Very good. Uh, she still got it. Uh, all right. Then I will have uh, three transparencies. I don't want to stop it. I just uh, want to, uh, to say what was the idea. It's conservation laws, and the physics has uh, much applications, much problems which can be solved by, by just uh, uh, reasoning along the lines of conservation laws. For our double junctions, there are three distinct regimes. We can apply the following conservation of uh, uh, laws. If energy is conserved, there is a conservation of particle at each energy which allows you to get Ohm's law. If uh, the electrons between two, um, uh, two conductors make a light exchange energy, 
there's no uh, conservation of charge at each energy, but there is a global conservation of charge. And there is also global energy conservation. And that allows us to solve everything and eventually reproduce on slow. Right. So it's set up when we have even uh, bigger spacing between the junctions and that cools itself or with, 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 with the help of a fan so that, that, that uh, we don't have overheating. Then we just apply one remaining law, conservation of current and we still in business on slow. Good, uh, that's the end of pedagogical part. Any questions, comments about this? So basically we understood that um, Ohm's law can be reproduced at the level of coherent waves. This fancy reasoning, this fancy um, concept of resonances inside the structure, transmission resonances. We understood the link of scattering approach and more classical approach to quantum transport in solids, which involves uh, Liouville equation, Boltzmann equation, drug diffusion equation, and uh, finally, finite element theory of Gustav Kirchhoff. Okay? Are we ready to go further? Fine. Uh, first of all, to give some motivation, basic it's repetition of what uh, I told. Disorder and coherence. Coherence is a property of uh, quantum wave to be quantum wave to be the wave. So the phase of wave function is capped. So many channel systems are disordered by virtues, there are imp uh, imperfections, there are random phase shifts I talked about. So, uh, but the wave pattern is still a wave pattern. The only way it becomes very complex. So disorder in fact conceals coherence conceals interference effects in uh, quantum transport. Okay, there are ways to reveal the coherence. Eventually noise and full counting statistics uh, can give you some signatures of coherence already. Uh, there are traces of interference which we discuss in this experiment. So, you know, uh, um, cold war era experiments about weak localization and conductance fluctuations. Magic mirrors, who remembers what are magic mirrors? How to make a magic mirror? Yeah, superconductors. Right. So this magic, this magic uh, mirrors uh, uh, just connecting uh, um, conductors to superconduct, uh, to superconductors we can reveal this um, uh, hidden co coherence. Right, if disorder is non-stationary, magic would not help. Non-stationary disorder doesn't conserve energy, and yeah, you hopelessly have an elastic processes. Everything is classical, coherence is lost. Good, then, yeah, it's a bit about magic mirror, but since we have recently discussed superconductors, I just skip the story about this. It's just uh, the fact that one can realize with superconductors ideal mirror. Uh, the price to pay it is to have two component wave function, which consists of electrons and holes. Without this, one cannot realize this phase conjugated mirror. 
Right, then let's uh, forget all the stuff you have learned. Let's get the uh, first quantum mechanical book. I hope that all of you had g a good qu first quantum mechanical book. You know, a, a, a first quantum mechanical uh, book is like first laugh. It can <laughs> actually determine the rest of your life, at least of your quantum <laughs> life. So how to figure out if you had a uh, true love or uh, less successful one. <laughs> is just to check if your quantum mechanical book, first quantum mechanical book, contains this derivation. Normally it's a, it's a page seven. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't read it, you skip it, you go to more interesting chapters, but well, Although you could, uh, could, could uh, forget your first laugh, it's always with you. Uh, right, what kind of derivation it is? Uh, it is uh, sh uh, the derivation of conservation of probability. Wave function associated with probability in quantum mechanics. And to make this association consistent, one has to prove that the probability current conserves that its divergence is zero, right? That's why it's in a good quantum book, it's somewhere in the first pages. Because it's not enough to say square root of wave function is probability. It's important to show that this is consistent with Schrodinger equation. Good. So, they start with Schrodinger equation, which contains kinetic part and potential, and they assume that the current of probability has the following form. Just a matter of trial. So it uh, takes wave functions, it takes two wave functions, psi, psi conjugated, well, it's about probability. So two wave functions should come into play. Gradients, that's also natural for the current. Good. And then they kind of, uh, by direct calculation, show that whatever the equation, whatever complex potential is here, if you differentiate it, if you apply Schrodinger equation at this step, it is zero. Fine. Quantum mechanics is consistent. Okay, uh, just curious, who remembers something about this uh, piece, about this derivation? Oh, quite many people. Very good, excellent. You're not, you, you didn't only ha have a good quantum book, you have also read it, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fine. Let me do what is not in the books. Let me generalize this approach a bit. Let's take uh, um, two solutions of certain equation. And let's play eventually a very similar game. Let's define a current which involves these two solutions. And let's run the same derivation. Then we will get, which could be rather than expected, that divergence of this current is zero, at least if the energies of these two solutions are the same. Okay, and if the energies are, uh, energy difference is small, the uh, conservation is approximate, one can still utilize it, and persists, persists at long scales. All right, what does it mean? It, it means that quantum mechanics eventually provides you with a lots of conservation laws just for free. There uh, is, in principle, infinite number of solutions of Schrodinger equation at each energy. So there is one can formulate infinite number of conservation laws. 
let me give some examples of this current. One example we have had already. We talk about spin currents, right? How does it come about? We have two component wave function. And we can arrange an expression like this. So the current will acquire matrix indices corresponding to spin indices of the wave function uh, of the wave function spin up and spin down. And spin current conserves if there is no spin orbit conservation, if there is no scattering. Uh, in which involves uh, spin. Fine. The result is equation for density matrix, which is divergence of matrix current, matrix, density, mm. looks like voltage, spin accumulation. Right, one can uh, expand it in uh, terms of spin. All right. And uh, one can utilize conservation of uh, spin. But there is kind of classical conservation of spin, if you wish. One can uh, write it conservation of uh, uh, classical quantity, which is called uh, spin density. One can introduce spin currents. That would be for spin one half. For spin, say, three halves, it would be uh, the same conservation of three components of spin. But the number of indices here is much bigger. So there are extra conservation laws of spin not covered by quantum, but classical mechanics. Good. Uh, yet another example. Magic mirrors. Superconductors, electrons, holes. I don't want to write superconductors much. I just say, well, there are two waves in normal metal, uh, red and blue, electrons and holes. And I can arrange magic currents in the same way. They all conserve. All right, there are some conditions to follow, right? To conserve spin currents, we had to assume that there is no spin of it. Uh, interaction for magic mirrors, we need to assume that the Hamiltonian is, is, is time reversible. Anyway, there are possibilities to um, make conservation laws. Good. That's, of course, nice, fundamental, and completely useless activity because there are no obvious physical quantities associated with this conserving currents. Fine. So we again at uh, professor level. Many words about nothing. Fortunately, one can be Gustav Kirchhoff also in this field. Right? So although these currents are not associated with physic obviously physical quantities, one can utilize conservation of these currents in order to build up quantum circuit series for multi-channel situations. Uh, how does it go? It's a bit unusual way for a physicist. I uh, won't tell you about concrete theory with physical contact. Uh, rather, I would play what? I would play somebody like a programmer of, uh, or web designer. I would give you a template of a circuit theory, and it would be up to you to fill this template with, uh, with physical contacts. Uh, is it very unusual for physics? No, not, no, no, not that much. For instance, a conservation law. There is a certain template, balance, 
flows which uh, have to be balanced according to conservation law. You could implement eventually the same equations for conservation of electricity, conservation of energy, conservation of money even, if you go to finance after your graduation. And uh, that works. <coughs> template of conservation law. Similar template I would present right away. So there are matrix currents, concerned matrix uh, currents, and uh, there has to be voltage associated with these currents. Matrix voltage. Matrix voltage is a property of the, voltage is a property of a lead. Matrix voltage is a property of reservoir, right? What's the difference? Lead has only voltage. Reservoir can have, for instance, filling factor, can have superconductivity inside, uh, has more properties. And that all expresses a matrix. And okay, it has funny properties. Squat of this matrix is one, trace of this is zero. For template properties. Here's the examples of concrete matrix voltages. For instance, we just care about Landauer formula then this matrix just contains filling factors corresponding to reservoirs. Uh, full counting statistics, it also incorporates counting field, this uh, you know, argument of the characteristic function. Spin, each filling factor becomes a spin density matrix, so it's 4 by 4 matrix. Uh, superconductivity, electrons and holes, yet another dimension for this matrix voltage. So all these different examples, they go, they fit very nice into this general template. Fine. Let me show how does it work. First of all, we've been talking about scattering, about universality, that any uh, nanostructure can be regarded as a, as a complex scattering matrix. And we only care about a set of transmission coefficients of this matrix. And it turns out that for any realization, of matrix voltage, the matrix current is expressed like this. So there is a formula, well, unfortunately or fortunately, it's nonlinear relation, but the matrix current through a Landauer connector, which is characterized by a set of transmission coefficients, can be expressed in terms of uh, matrix voltages at the end. For more theoretically inclined people, I shall mention that letter G for matrix voltage is not a random letter. It comes from green functions. Very good. One can compute this matrix uh, voltages from green functions of the reservoirs. Fine. So let me just finish the template. Let me uh, come to quantum circuit theory. OK, you start with nanostructure, which is complex like this. According to following to Kirchhoff, you would like to simplify it. You separate it into elements, right? For instance, uh, for instance these things, they would be better nodes. Well, these narrow things would better be constrictions, okay? Finite element approximation. So, okay, we have a system with two nodes and three black boxes, three scatterers. And there are two leads and uh, the matrix voltages are fixed in the leads, very much like voltages are fixed in traditional circuit theory. And 
and we have to figure out the Green's, uh, I should not say it. I shouldn't say Green's functions. Uh, I have to say matrix voltages, okay? Ac according to term five. We have to solve a matrix voltages in the nodes. What's the underlying assumption? We actually regard the node as a reservoir, right? This is basic assumption for this quantum theory. Okay, and that requires that conductance is big, much, much bigger than conductance quantum. There are many channels uh, in the structure. Good. That's it that I wanted, that's what I wanted to say. I could uh, give you uh, what I gave in my matrix, uh, master course, some concrete examples of uh, such series, some of them very simple, some are very involved, like uh, non-equilibrium effects and superconductivity, but all of them can be formulated with the help of simple Kirchhoff rules, which still care about quantum mechanics. Questions? Some, uh, I think I'm done with anti-pedagogical part. <laughs> yes? It could, as any for any complex device, uh, you could kind of buy extra gadgets, uh, plug it in. It's uh, in principle uh, there's a possibility of plug-ins into this uh, uh, quantum quantum theory. But usually, for practical purposes, again, it's. Uh, it is uh, usually not necessary. You don't uh, want to, get to, to, to buy a complex device and uh, uh, buy a plug-in. You could buy a separate gadget. Yeah, it has uh, more or less the same um, regime of applicability as Ohm's law, okay. right? So it's valid only for self-energy or big number of channels. Again, the difference between that scheme and Ohm's law is that Ohm's law disregards all quantum effects and that keeps it running. Thank you.